right, good afternoon, everybody. Got a lot of, lot of friends here, I see. I'm Dave Stump, ASC, Director of Photography, Cinematographer, and I'm here to talk about uh, high dynamic range, uh, high frame rates, color gamuts, uh, and just in general, future-proofing your movie. Let me figure out how this works. There we go. So I want to talk to you today about uh, high resolution and ultra high definition television, uh, wide color gamuts, Rec 2020, high dynamic range and increased sensitivity in cameras, uh, ACES, the Academy Color Encoding System, uh, higher brightness displays, including monitors and uh, cinemas, high frame rates and wide shutter angles. And I got a lot to get through, so I'll move pretty quick. Uh, all of us have kind of been through the evolution of digital from the dark ages to the modern times. So I don't want don't to go into that too much, but I'll, I'll just say that uh, we've all survived the K wars, but K is not all there is to it, okay? Um, we've arrived at a point where we've got um, cinema, digital cinema at 4K, 4096 by 2160, and UHD TV at 3840 uh, by 2160. Uh, UHD TV is obviously four times the size of HD television, and DCI 4K is even larger. So what I'm really here to talk about is future-proofing your movie. How to make your movie so that you don't hit any of the traditional bottlenecks of the older workflows, okay? So let's see a little bit of footage from something I just did. It's an indie feature. It's called The Unwilling. It's a supernatural horror film. And uh, if you could go ahead and roll the clip, we'll watch a little bit of it. There's, there's no sound on this. Now we haven't done, we haven't really done the HDR trim on this uh, movie yet. So this is just through a LUT for HDR viewing for today's purposes. And it's a little, this shot's a little contrasty, a little saturated. A lot of this, this movie was done in very, very low light conditions. I want to see if anybody spots the spooky part of this scene. What ISO? 1200 ISO for this. Shooting practically in the dark. Boy, it's so much more effective with music and sound effects. Stephen wins the prize. Hold on, there's more.
I'm going to bet that every cinematographer here who has ever shot in Los Angeles has worked in this old rundown house. <laughs> That's the one. Did they? Over on Harvard Street near downtown. Yeah. Crenshaw District. So this is from the ending of the film. Uh, Lance Henriksen plays the father who has passed away. I don't want to give away too much of the plot, but he comes back to visit his son. Okay. That's probably enough of the clip. We can go back to the PowerPoint. So I want to talk about the workflow that I'm attempting to use in this picture in order to, to make the, the movie saleable and to make it future-proof. I used an all Sony camera workflow using the F65, the F55. Uh, sorry, that's a picture of the F5. We also use the FS7 as well. Uh, we used Sony F65 to capture uh, 4096 by 2160 DCI 4K, raw and low light conditions on location and on stage. We use the F65 for high frame rate work for visual effects, and we used it for green screens and smoke elements. We used the, the 55 for the majority of the first unit work, uh, recording DCI 4K in both raw and XAVC. And the FS7 was used as a third camera in 4K, uh, also capturing in XAVC, uh, very frequently on a Movi Freefly. We used uh, from Bertoni Visuals, Gianluca Bertoni, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we used his uh, Dreadnought DIT cart to uh, transcode the movie on set and to store and generate dailies. Uh, we're using a DaVinci Resolve for the, um, for the DI work. Um, and uh, eventually, we're going to get around to doing a high dynamic range pass on the movie. Um, we're still in the audio uh, part of the program right now where we're adding sound effects and music to the movie. So I'm not going to do the HDR pass until I've finished the audio work on the film. We also uh, ex extensively used Sony's RAW tools both uh, the raw viewer and uh, the uh, raw player and uh, what's the other one called? Uh, Sony Catalyst, prepare. We used Leica Digital Cinema Prime, Sumalux C, along with Fujinon uh, 19 to 90 Cabrio lenses. We used a lot of Tiffin effects filter plugins, including digital ProMist and digital black ProMist, digital glimmer glass. Uh, we did a lot of uh, touch-ups on the girls. 
Now, I want to talk about color gamut because this is pretty widely misunderstood in the industry. Color gamut is the range of colors that you can create in an RGB system, in our case, based on primaries and the enclosure that they define. So this is the, the uh, color locus diagram for the standard HD uh, color gamut, Rec. 709. And it's a, it's a fairly confined set of colors. Digital cinema was de defined with wider primaries. You see the DCI P3 color space there is bigger than Rec. 709. But bigger still is the new, still developing Rec. 2020 proposed color space. And that color gamut encompasses a lot of really saturated colors. You can see neons, bright sources, uh, really saturated things like red neon, green neon, deep colors, really, really pop in Rec. 2020. But if you're going to, if you're going to aim for a Rec. 2020 finish, you have to you have to create a workflow that doesn't decimate or clip any of those colors anywhere else along the way. So in order to, to capture those colors, you need a camera that has primaries that are capable of capturing those colors, not a Rec. 709 camera. And to that end, Sony have developed S Gamut 3 and S Gamut uh, 3 Cine. S Gamut 3 Cine is capable of capturing DCI P3 colors very, very nicely and enclosing that triangle. The S Gamut 3 is also capable of, of capturing uh, Rec. 2020 colors. So you can see that if, if you have a, a capture system that encloses all of the colors available in that color space, then you're not clipping any colors with your camera. You're not missing anything. You're capturing everything that Rec. 2020 can give you as a finished product. So how do they do that? Uh, they also use uh, a log encoding that is capable of encoding much more dynamic range than we're accustomed to seeing in standard Rec. 709 imaging as well. Uh, so S-Log3 is kind of based on Cineon's digital uh, film encoding curve. And it's, it's very close to a pure log curve. Wider latitude encodings um, capture more stops of light. And that, that kind of leads us to risk in our current workflows using too few code values to encode the images. In 10-bit log, we have roughly 1,000 code values or 70 code values per stop of light uh, over the course of uh, 12 or 13 stops. If you, if you start to encode more stops of light, you need more code values to encode them. Wide gamuts like S Gamut 3 and S Gamut 3 Cine are more effectively captured, encoded, and manipulated using higher bit depth encoding. Um, both of these gamuts and this, this log encoding work very, very well in ACES, the Academy Color Encoding System. And this year, uh, I think Sony are announcing at this show that they are ACES compliant and they're releasing new IDTs for all of their cameras so that you can plug into an ACES workflow with the Sony F65, F55, all of these Sony cameras. Uh, So what do I mean when I talk about traditional uh, encodings and, and traditional finishes? The de facto format that we've been using for years since the advent of digital has been 10-bit log DPX. 10-bit log uses 900 to 1,000 code values to encode the entire tonal range of each primary color, giving us a, a billion discrete colors. <clears throat> That works out to about 70 code values per stop of light. Just enough to keep us from banding or aliasing when we finish our, our, our shows in DI. 
What happens when we resample colors as a normal function of color correction? Well, um, every time you resample, for example, what I did here was I changed the gamma a couple of times on a, a simple black to white ramp. And as you, as you bake those changes in a number of times, you start to get banding and aliasing across the frame, and you no longer get smooth, smooth ranges of tone. Those are cumulative decimations of your digital data. They're rounding errors in the color corrector. At least in, in integer color correction, these round, rounding errors are cumulative. Integer math is, is to blame for this. And uh, when, uh, when you're resampling colors and resampling tones, as you move the knobs, code values change in integer increments. So if you change the, the gamma on a curve by, uh, for, for any given pixel by 0.49 of a code value, it remains the same code value. If you change it by 0.51 of a code value, it jumps up to the next code value. Those errors accumulate and that leads to really, really crunchy looking stuff out of the color corrector. That's, that's one of the side effects of integer math in color correctors. The ACES color gamut includes all possible human visible colors and it's capable of 30 stops encoded and it encodes at 1,024 steps per stop or thereabouts using floating point math. Floating point math doesn't accumulate rounding errors and is reversible. ACES is a contain, as a container is a constrained version of OpenEXR, which is a well-known SMPTE standard that, that began at ILM for visual effects work in coding. And it's already very widely used. So ACES is capable of enclosing any color space that we've yet invented and any color that human beings can see. But it's also close enough to real RGB to be used as a working space. Higher bit depth with 30 or thereabout stops of uh, range to encode. Um, images encoded at 16 bits half float uh, are, there are way more color code values than you could ever, ever, ever imagine that you would need for finishing the image. <clears throat> Using exponential math also uh, allows us to precisely reverse uh, color transforms. The current generation of digital cameras captures a, a huge range of luminance values uh, and improvements in sensor design and log systems have improved the, the, the ability of current generation cameras to capture higher dynamic range. High dynamic range images can better record the range of luminance levels found in real world scenes. The push towards high dynamic range acquisition is relentless these days. Human vision is capable of very high dynamic range. On a bright sunny day, we can see cloud highlight details while still being able to see into deep shadows with our eyes. In dark environments, we can see detail in extremely low light. Cameras every year eke closer toward the capabilities of human vision. HDR imaging is giving us the ability to display a wider and richer range of colors brighter highlights, deeper blacks, much more detail in midtones, but the increased color saturation of Rec 2020 also contributes to a richer viewing experience. HDR preserves more detail in the darkest areas and brightest areas of a picture. Screen brightness in movies is measured in foot lamberts. A foot lambert equals uh, one over pi candelas per square foot or 3.46 candela per square meter. Emissive dis display screen brightness, like LED screens, are measured in units called nits. 
The standard for reflected luminance from a DCI motion picture screen is 14 foot Lamberts. This equates to about 48 nits on an emissive display. Most HD TVs operate somewhere in the 100 to 400 nits range, depending on whether you left it the way you bought it at Best Buy or if you tuned it to look a little better. Uh, HDR standards are not settled yet, but we appear to be headed to somewhere in the range of 1,000 to 2,000 nits, several stops brighter any way you cut it than traditional motion picture screens. Well, what does that mean? It means, for starters, we need a new electro-optical transfer function. This is the old transfer function of gamma. Uh, EOTF is important to define how the images are mapped from the, the files into a display. New HDR systems are much brighter and have huge dynamic range, and therefore they demand completely scientific approach to the electro-optical uh, transfer function. What is being developed now is called the PQ curve, or perceptual quantization curve, which promises to be an efficient way to encode extended dynamic range, giving us a luminance curve specifically designed for high brightness displays. New display technology allows direct viewing of HDR at full dynamic range without conversion LUTs or changes to the native image. Uh, we're, use, we're going to be using the BVM X300 to do the HDR grade when we get to it on our movie. And uh, this is about a thousand nit uh, grading monitor and it's very, very stable and very, very reliable. Also, laser projection is upping the game in cinemas. Uh, digital cinema projectors are all over this show with laser light sources, and they can get to much more saturated colors and much higher brightness levels than xenon-powered projectors ever could. So that's going to have an effect on a lot of the traditions of cinema. 24 frames per second was born in the 30s <coughs> when Warner's um, made the jazz singer and synchronized the sound to the picture. Uh, an engineer named Stanley Watkins created the 24 frame standard as sort of a, a compromise between flicker and the expense of film. But Edison, when he invented the cinematograph, began his experiments assuming that 30 frames per second was almost too low for projecting moving images. He thought it should be higher up in the 60 to 80 frame per second range, and that only because that was as fast as he could crank his camera. Picture brightness, frame rate, shutter angle are all intimately related to image perception. The missing picture information between frames is one of the principal causes of strobing or judder or flicker. The brighter the picture, the more objectionable that flicker is going to become. So as we move towards higher brightness, 1,000 nits, 2,000 nits, 28-foot uh, Lamberts, 40-foot uh, Lamberts, higher brightness both in cinema and in uh, television, 24 frames per second is going to become more and more of a problem. I want to get into an area that I, has become one of my new pet uh, areas of research. Uh, all motion picture cameras have a shutter open, shutter closed exposure cycle, and both film and digital cameras can be reduced in shutter angle but film cameras generally were mostly limited to a maximum of 180 out of 360 possible degrees uh, of shutter open angle. 
Does everybody get that? The, the shutter is closed for 180 degrees of the cycle and open for 180 degrees of the cycle. So the missing information is about as much as the information in the pictures taken. The spatial resolution of digital cinema cameras and high brightness displays has reached the point where temporal resolution afforded by current frame rate has become a significant limitation. Increasing the frame, weight will, frame rate will improve the portrayal of motion and raising the frame rate to maintain the balance between static and dynamic re resolution will only become more important. Was anybody here over the weekend to see Ang Lee's movie demonstrated? It's, uh, it's a pretty awesome and bold move. He shot that at 120 frames per second per eye in 3D. And I suppose they'll have to integrate it down to other synthetic frame rates to show it in conventional theaters. But I'm going to go see it at 120 frames per second per eye. <clears throat> the motion artifacts associated with 24 frame screen refresh rates, uh, like Flickr, are about to become more and more objectionable uh, as we get into this new era of image projection and display. High frame rate will offer compatibility with the dif uh, different conventional frame rates adopted internationally. Higher capture and display frame rates will lead to a, an improvement in picture quality going forward. How are frame rate and shutter angle related to image perception? Oh, did I just hit the? Here we go. <clears throat> so I've created a little illustration of how judder happens, how how flicker happens in pictures. What I did was I took a little flashlight and I waved it in the dark and I shot it at 24 frames per second, in this case at 180 degree shutter angle. And you can see that the, the missing information the, where the shutter was closed, you don't get to see the flashlight going across the screen and that's, that missing information between frame stations is what causes judder what causes flicker in, in images. So to emphasize the point, I did this at a 90 degree shutter angle op uh, opening. So you can see that the shutter is open for 90 degrees of the, the cycle and closed for 270. And the gap between frame stations gets bigger. So the image flickers more. Um, this is kind of the saving private Ryan effect. It, it makes things judder and, and jumpy, and it, it's a nervous sort of feel to the, to the movie. And then just to, just to exaggerate it, I went to an 11 degree shutter opening. So you can see that the shutter practically freezes the flashlight slashing across the frame, and the distance between the frame stations is vast, it's huge compared to the actual image of the flashlight. So this looks very staccato, very, very strange. But digital cameras give you the ability to do something we could never do before. And that is that you can open up the shutter to 359.9 degrees open and a, a small fraction of a degree shutter close time to drain the image off the sensor. And if you look really, really close, you can see the tiny little gap between each frame station. And uh, this is a really striking looking effect. I wouldn't use it for a lot of a movie, but there are times when it's extremely effective. And I do a variation on this theme a lot if I've got to pan somebody quickly across a room or if I've got a drive by or something that I think is really going to judder and strobe a lot in a shot, a very fast pan. I won't open up to 359, but I might open up to, to 300 or 270 or, or something that makes, makes the shot a little more watchable so that it doesn't judder at 24 frames per second. But my new pet peeve is something that I've been doing for several years now. Uh, 
Who here had to synchronize a camera to the old HMIs that used to flicker so badly? So you know that there was a, there was a magic shutter angle that you could use uh, at 144 degrees that would, that would keep the 60 cycle lights, AC lights, from flickering at 24 frames per second. Well, as it turns out, there's another magical window at twice that shutter angle, 288. And if I'm going to go outside and shoot a night exterior in downtown LA with a lot of light sources that I can't control, neons and intermittent sources and things that are going to blink, I'll, the first thing I'll try is I'll shoot a little test of those lights at 288.8. And if, uh, if that doesn't get it, they're really, really stubborn, weird lights, because this kills almost every flicker that you can get on a night exterior, especially in uncontrolled circumstances. And you can see it's more like the 359 degree shutter with a shorter gap between frame stations, so it's, it's easier to watch motion when you shoot this way. And you can see that it's a flicker-free window, so if you've got weird night exterior lights or weird illuminance or strange sources, this really, really, really can help you to overcome the flicker problems that you'll have in uncontrolled circumstances. And you're gaining exposure, right? Yeah, you, uh, that's one of the side benefits is uh, at 288.8, you actually gain half, two-thirds of a stop of exposure. So I think I've gotten through this presentation in record time. Uh, I think I'll just uh, leave you with this thought. Uh, the old um, Chinese expression that was purported to be a curse, may you live in interesting times. We certainly live in interesting times. Thank you to Gianluca Bertoni. Uh, I don't know where he is, but he helped me immensely on this movie. And uh, thank you all very much for coming. Any questions? Um, the question was, what are we viewing these images on? Does somebody from Sony want to uh, give the technical explanation for that? Peter, perhaps? What is this, uh, this gentleman right here? It's a 4K high dynamic range LED video screen. It is neither projected nor back projected. It is an emissive display. What are the specifics if you wanted to work in pieces as a colorist? What is a colorist have to do? The question was what does a colorist have to do? to adopt uh, working in ACES. And that really is just a question of using ACES compliant hardware and software and making sure that you, you don't clip your original material to anything smaller before you get it into the color corrector. So there are a lot of ways to cut off the possibilities or the values of working in ACES, including to use a smaller gamut than um, what you intend to, to show the movie in, uh, to use a smaller bit depth than you intend to, to finish the movie in. If you, if you work mindful of your workflow to preserve all of your camera data at its biggest and at, at its broadest, then it's just a question of working with an ACES compliant color corrector and being mindful of, of obeying those rules internally. Anyone else? Nothing? All right. David Stumpe, AC, ladies and gentlemen.